And I'm really excited about this, especially the first group of panelists. I'm a little biased. Oh, but, uh, but this first group of panelists, when we think of the future, we have to start with them. We have amazing youth leaders, and then we have some good trouble community leaders here as well. I would now like to call up Divya Nair, EPI Policy Director, um, Diet, <laughs> Policy Analyst, who is working on paid leave, child care, public supports, and a million other economic justice issues to introduce what we are calling our Dreamers Panel. Divya? session. Anytime there was a research request or a question, she was on top of it. And that takes me to our next panelist, Sylvia Perot, a peer support specialist at Foster Forward, where she works directly with youth experiencing homelessness. And lastly, we have Kariana Bone. She is a senior at PCTA and the lead advocacy organizer at the youth-led organization Arise. Now before we begin our panel, I have to take a quick survey. And I say this with all the kindness in my heart. Please raise your hand if you are over the age of 25. <laughs> I think it is safe to say that well over 90% of the room just raised their hand. So with that being said, I'm going to ask that you take note as to what our young leaders are about to speak on. Specifically, as relates to their lived experience and their perspectives on organizing, advocacy, and policy decision making. And I also just want to emphasize 
that we see in front of you is not necessarily the future. They are the present. So in whatever order we want to kick things off for the Dreamers panel, my first question for our panelists is, what community services or programs do you see making a big difference in your community on a daily basis that you believe would benefit from increased investments in funding? That was a lot heavier than I expected. Uh, <laughs> hello everyone, my name is Marco. Um, as David Miles mentioned, I use him pronouns. Um, also want to clarify, I am no longer co-chair of the board. That is Wujuda. Um, I sat down as I graduated. And yeah, I just want to honor my fellow youth leader. But one thing... So one thing I really want to highlight in this is after school programs as a form of investment, not only in the present, but our future as well. When we think of after school pro programs, you think about the YMCA, but you can also think about workforce development, you can think about college access, and for me especially, this was important. I now go to Brown University, which is a very hard to get into school. these after school programs like Breakthrough Providence, like Young Voices, who really allowed me to see myself in a position that is dominated by white people. You only see people of color in these schools and these institutions. They allowed me to dream and they allowed me to see a future where I can now get the education that I deserve and the education that not many people can afford as well. Um, so yeah, and then also on the adult a aspect of things, after school programs really offer a space where children can go and not have to worry about how to get home. Uh, parents can continue working and not have to worry like, oh shoot, I have to miss hours of work to go pick up my child. And I know like one thing, even in my own family, that we often had to discuss was if my mom were to work, who was gonna pick me up after school? And like, how was I gonna get home when like taking the bus wasn't necessarily like an option for me. Um, and just like all these complex decisions that we have to make as a family can be alleviated by after schools. So last year there was the Blue Spill, which I believe did not pass. And I highly encourage legislators in the room to take a look at that bill and really raise it up this legislative season. That offered so much funding to after school programs and by bringing that bill back into this legislative season, we're gonna see a huge change. And also, just the investment. We're gonna see that money back. We already see that money back when we think about programs like Prepare RI. So really just focus on what you want. And I think our last speaker did an amazing job at this. But what are you gonna lose by not investing? That's what we're gonna do. Hold us accountable, Marco. Thank you for those comments. There's another panelist who again would like to answer. What community services or programs do you see making a big difference in your communities that you think would benefit from increased funding and investments? I'll add on to this. So um, community services that I see that would need way more investment in my community specifically and in other lower income communities as well is Community Care Alliance in Woonsocket. They focus a lot on the homeless population that we have and they provide resources such as healthcare, how to um, look for job trainings and stuff of that sort. The Harbor Youth Center, which focuses on youth employment and development, it's a program that I usually go to after school um, when I have questions about employment or what to do after college. After high school, sorry. <laughs> So when it comes to going to college, because sometimes my high school doesn't really focus on that. The Loggers Project, which focuses on mutual aid and community engagement, they have a lot of resource events, such as having food and clothing drives, Narcan training, which is important. I feel like the services um, that focus on mutual aid and community engagement needs to be funded more just because our communities are um, impoverished and don't have that mutual um, support from our policymakers sometimes. So it's the community members that are left to have to do that work in our communities. 
without having the funding from our policymakers, our community members, our left wondering how are we going to make this happen, how are we going to make this possible. And I've had experience with that as well, being the um, Vice President for Silence and Violence 401. Our main focus is literally mutual aid and community engagement. We do things such as poetry night, Osaka Day play that kind of gives that resource to young athletes in Rhode Island. Having um, a village vigil to kind of like heal what's going on in the community, community forums, and um, food and clothing drives. We always focus on where are we going to get the funding from, where are we, we going to get the money from, because sometimes our policymakers and our communities don't really listen to us and hear us. So when we push and when we advocate, that's when we get change happening in our communities, because nobody can change in our communities except for the community members themselves. I feel like. Um, Um, just to close that out, I feel like having an increased, um, increased um, investment in our community um, organizations will also bridge the gap between um, community members, policymakers, and politicians. Investment into our community organizations will build a connection with our policymakers and invest investors and um, community members. So we won't have to focus on where the money, where are we going to get the money from, or how is more going to be like. Where are we going to do with the money that we have now? What can, change can we do because money is not enough, you know, the problem? It's what's going on in the community that's the problem. So moving on to our next question, which I'm especially excited and a little bit biased about because I've seen some of y'all at the State House, the realms of City Hall, and just at the picket lines protesting and organizing. I'm curious to know, as young advocates, for changes in your community. What has your advocacy experience been like? Specifically, what would you highlight, but what would you also reference as challenges in that experience? Okay, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Sophie Perot. I'm a job-paying peer support specialist at Foster Forward, which serves youth that are homeless or experiencing housing disability that have experienced foster care. I also have lived the experience of total of five years in the Rhode Island foster care system. When I think about my advocacy journey, it started in 2021, shortly after I aged out of the foster care system. I really don't know how I got involved in advocacy. It just kind of happened. It started with Foster Club. Um, some challenges that I have seen throughout my advocacy journey is there's a lot of tokenism. You know, it's, it's great to bring lived experts in the room, but what do you do with what they're telling you? Writing what they say down on a piece of paper and posting it on a website is, is not progressive to me. It's totally mm -hmm. And I, I don't see enough lived experts in the rooms, especially when it's decision making, and that to me is a huge red flag. I would say my advocacy journey definitely has been a great one. I have made so many connections and I'm so grateful, but there's a long way to go. So I feel like um, it's been very 
progressive in a way as in like it's um, developed me to really speak about that. Yeah, adding on to that, um, so I'm a part of a collaborative called the Anti-Racist Education Collaborative, partnered by um, Burnett Kids Count, and then Arise, PSU, Youth in Action, and Young Voices, um, also PLEA. So it's a big network, intergenerational, and for me at least, and especially when I'm in that space, it's kind of a moment of frustration when we're talking about advocacy. We say a lot of these things, and kind of like what you're saying as well, we're tokenized a lot of the time. We have these good ideas, um, helpful ideas, and then they're like, oh, I'm gonna write that down. And then what are you doing after that? Not really anything. Um, for example, and I'm gonna give a clear example of this. When we're talking about SROs, and I think, for those that don't know, those are school resource officers. And a lot of the time we talk about um, how are we gonna get the funding for things? How are we gonna afford these huge implementation of programs? And this comes up a lot when we're talking about mental health professionals in schools, but every single year that I've been in advocacy work, I've seen a different SRO implementation bill, and the students in the schools are outwardly saying, we don't like them, they're not helpful. And I think it was especially um, funny last legislative season, because we were in um, the testimony room, we're testifying against these bills, and one of the legislators, instead of saying, as POC, I hear you, I see you, uh, well, they were white, but still, <laughs> as white like, people of color that are speaking out here are spending their day after school when they should be doing homework here in our state house, um, like testifying against SROs, what I'm gonna tell you is that my white child is having an amazing experience with theirs. They're having lunch together, they're really like, having a fun time while what we see in our schools or what I've heard because I was privileged enough not to go to a school with SROs, what we've heard is that students are getting beaten, they're getting yelled at, they're getting abused in a variety of ways, but we're still talking about implementing more because that's the solution. Instead, what we should be talking about is mental health professionals and that same funding can go to helping our teachers understand what mental health is for their own sake, but also for their students' sake, getting more mental health professionals, because right now, um, I don't know the current statistics, but in one of my readings, I think it was like one per 375 students. That's not enough. We're gonna spend weeks until we get the mental health support that we need, and we can't afford to have weeks on that. That's when we see students not going to school, that's when we see students um, like harming themselves. So the solutions are there, and we're talking about the solutions. And I think that's the frustrating component of all this, because there's always a way to deflect it. So I think what we're gonna talk about more, of course, is just how to hold yourself accountable when you're in these spaces of privilege, but don't understand, like, aren't doing enough to support it. And there are some amazing people, even in this room, and for those that don't know, I'm not talking about you necessarily, but if you resonate with it, maybe you should do a little bit more. Thanks, <laughs> Michael. I think I want to take off on like do a little bit more. I think for me, I never, definitely as a teenager, I was never in the advocacy space. It only kind of started uh, once I was in college and started my career trajectory. And so I would request of you all to be mentors for the young people in your life. Um, I think that was something I really struggled with, was like, how can I do this work? I'm starting off empty. I don't know anyone who's in advocacy. Um, and during my experience at EPI, I had been challenged to do networking, which I hate, uh, and I'm going to love. Uh, <laughs> I've been challenged to be in leadership programs, um, and that is something I would really like. That would be you know, my call to action to you all, is challenge the young people in your life to do this work, because they want to, it's just a little bit scary sometimes, I would say.
thank you all so much for sharing. And Mark, I remember being in that committee room when that comment was made and just feeling that secondhand frustration, seeing the faces of all those young students who had taken the time out of their day to be there only to be met with that response. But that's why it's important that you all continue to have that presence at the State House. So this next question, y'all have already started answering to an extent, so I'm excited to hear the full answer. What do you think current policy makers and or advocates are currently missing in their decision-making process? Okay, so I feel like they're missing people in the community during their, their decision-making processes. Um, I feel like it's appropriate to have at least one community representative at the table with policymakers to ensure that the needs of the community members are being met. Because a lot of times you have policymakers and politicians in office who don't represent the community that they're, they're supposed to be representing. They're not in the community. They're, they're not actually living in the real community where they're supposed to be like making policies for. Like they'll be living like suburbia while their actual low-income residents are struggling to meet ends meet and they're living in a food desert. And they'll pass, those are laws that only like represent or benefit 10% 10, 10 or less of the community. So it's like, we need, we also need youth representatives at the table as well because like you said, we're the present now, we're also the ones to be the future and be the ones taking over what policymakers are um, deciding for us. So I feel like having a youth voice and making sure that our needs are being met, but also community members is really important as well. Hello. So I think one of the missing, again, is the experience, but also to add on to that, I think accountability is also missing as well. You know, if people in power, you know, have a duty to serve a certain population and they fail that population, that accountability needs to be there. And what I've seen through my advocacy journey is that there's a serious lack of accountability. You know, things just get swept under the rug. And when it comes to foster care, you know, it's not just a job, you're managing someone's life. So you should be taking it seriously. You know? The decisions you make affect that young person, and it could affect them in many different ways, and it could be long term. So I think accountability needs to be raised a lot more often. Um, to expand on what everyone else has been saying, I feel like the significance of youth voices in general um, is really missing. I feel like we progress more when we involve the youth, writing testimonies, hearing what they want, and even with that, we're still ignoring and pushing it aside, aside because they're young. Um, I feel like a lot of us are, especially like high schoolers, we're just like, developing more and are able to really know what we want but when we do say what we want or what we need it's not really valid because of our age so i feel like um you really need to see it from younger people's perspectives instead of adult perspectives because things like that also like correspond with us as well adding on to that because a lot of this is theoretical in a sense like it's kind of hard to imagine like oh how do we give students power um, and I know that sounds weird but like it's kind of hard to imagine the world where we are but there are already state leaders doing this and I want to uplift obviously Rep Morales um, because last year, last year we actually went through the process of writing a piece of legislation together as the anti-racist education collaborative, we researched and developed a piece of legislation that would um, allow the student member, the student co-chair, I believe, it's been a long time, guys, <laughs> the student co-chair on the board of second, primary and secondary education to have full voting rights. This has been done in other states, so it's not nuanced. Rhode Island is just a little slow in getting there. And it was actually an amazing process to have Rep. Morales sit with us and actually hear us out. Um, for a lot of us, this was a, like opening a can of worms because we weren't used to this process. So we were like, 
Oh, um, what about if we remove suspensions? What about if we add restorative practices? What if you do this? What if you do that? Um, and obviously we had to go down to one goal, or I believe a couple goals, but still, um, it was just so welcoming and I think like a powerful experience to see all of us get together and be able to talk to one of our representatives. Um, also, two other people I want to uplift, Senator Kano and Senator Kira Mack, they also do an amazing job of just speaking to the Because that's another issue. A lot of us can't afford to waste time talking to someone and maybe not having anything happen, especially for like people that work. Having to say, oh, I just got out of my dog, now I have to go to this meeting. Um, I don't know if anything's gonna happen, but I'm just gonna sit there. Maybe food's not even provided. There's these little things that really make a key difference when you're talking to people, and especially low-income communities, because we're not really in a position to say, yeah, I wanna go to this fun meeting. Like, you know, and then another thing is just the lack of translation in a lot of these meetings is seriously important. Um, I know, like, I do a lot of multilingual advocacy, and a lot of times we're discussing multilingual policies without ter interpretation. So there's these little things that we don't think about, but are so important when you're thinking about how to change society. Thank you all so much. Marco, I cannot say it again, that piece of legislation was without question like one of my favorite moments in the legislature, even if it was held for further study. <laughs> and I also want to just recognize my Senate sponsor, Val Lawson, who introduced it on her side. And very similarly, we have committee hearings, we have young people come out and share their voices. So rest assured, it will be reintroduced and we're going to work towards passage. And speaking of legislation and policy decisions, when we think about the policies that city leaders and state leaders should be considering, specifically as it relates to the stage you are in in your life, where you are preparing to transition, some of you are going to be graduating from high school, making that transition to college, some of you are going to be moving out of your parents' home and living on your own. What policy priorities do you think need to be put into place to improve the cost and standard of living in Rhode Island, especially as you prepare to make that transition to live on your own? All right, I'm gonna always bring it back to paid leave. If anyone knows me, they know I talk about paid leave every day. <laughs> paid leave program and it has been incredible for the people who are able to afford it because it's a huge cut on your paycheck if you do. And for someone like me, I'm in my mid-20s, um, if I ever have children, that's something that I can use, right? Um, but if I'm a, a single parent, if I'm someone who's working the minimum wage, I cannot afford this program that has been so critical um, for working families, for expanding families, um, for people who are taking care of their elderly parents. So that's something, you know, I'm currently advocating for. Um, two of the sponsors are here, Senator Lawson and uh, Rep Diaz. Um, and I think it's something that when we think of the standard of living, we think of these programs that aren't necessarily um, things like the minimum wage, which is definitely important, but something that we use um, as a safety net, as something that we can rely on um, for our future planning. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this question is difficult. I would like to uplift post-secondary education. So, a couple of months ago, I went to D.C. to Capitol Hill to learn about the Journey to Success campaign. If you don't know the Journey to Success campaign, I would highly recommend you look it up. There's just not enough time to explain it. But one of the things they focus on is Chafee. And Chafee funding is funding for youth that are either in foster care or have exited. And Chafee funding also can help with you know post-secondary education. But what I find is, is that 
a lot of the clients that I work with, it's not that they don't want to go to college, it's the trauma that they've endured so far. Their spirits are not there, it's broken, and a lot of the times, you know, we don't know what they went through while they were in care. They could have been thrown in multiple different homes, but safety cuts off at a certain age, I believe the age is 25. So if you have a youth that ages out at 21 and then is doing trauma work and therapy, you know, by the time that they're done, they're not going to have enough time to focus on their education. And if more youth got their degrees and more post-secondary education, we would see less youth in jail, we would see less poverty. It's just one thing that helps the other. So what I would like to see is more focus on post-secondary education because it's important. super important and I think expanding um, medical insurance to include mental health providers and just mental health support in general as a preventative measure instead of as a specialty because if we're being honest if you're getting mental health when you're already really bad well mental health support when you're already in a really bad place it can be too late for some people so really making sure that you're targeting people before it even gets bad and Honestly, like we think about mental health and we only think about disorders like depression or anxiety, but mental health can also just be like having really bad days and not knowing how to speak on that. Um, I think coming from an Hispanic household, it's always so hard to talk about feelings, and getting mental health support is just a way to learn those. It's a way to understand, like, and not necessarily for my family, but like for other people that violence isn't an answer for everything. And I know we learned this in kindergarten, but it doesn't really stick. And like, that's why we see a lot of violence um, in a lot of communities, because they don't understand why they feel this and how they can like, let it out. Um, and then another thing is just increasing the minimum wage. A statistic that I wrote down while the presentation was going on is that the federal, that's you by the way, uh, the federal minimum wage should be 23 an hour in comparison to the work. And while we do have the plan in place to go to 15 an hour in Rhode Island, I don't think that's enough. Because if you look at housing, that housing market, if you look at the housing market or just how much we spend on food alone, 13 an hour is not going to cover it. And that's why we see so many people kind of in dense populations because we're having to live together. We're having to support one another. And if we don't, then there's that situation where we're living paycheck to paycheck and thinking, how can I ration like a cereal box? Or how can I ration this food till the end of the month or till I get my next paycheck? And I don't, like, this is gonna sound crazy and very radical, but I don't think we should live like that. <laughs> I think we should have the ability to say, I wanna save up for maybe a nice day off or I should be able to have a vacation when I'm not feeling the best. Like there's these little things, and I don't mean vacation as in go to like California. I mean vacation as in like rest in my room and be able to read a book, or be able to not worry about the next big thing that's gonna come up. So I didn't preface it for this question, but this was the one where y'all should have been taking the notes, all right? Because they literally just outlined the plan as to how we actually support young people, and quite frankly, our communities as a whole. Okay. So for this last question, before we shift over to Q&A from the audience, I'm going to kindly ask that each panelist take a turn to answer. What are your hopes and dreams for socioeconomic justice in Rhode Island? Okay, I'll start. So I kind of have a few answers to this question. So the first one would be access to basic needs. Um, every community should be receiving um, essential and clean resources such as food, housing, education, and health care. Families shouldn't be worrying about turning on their faucet and seeing black water come down their um, drains, wondering if it's safe to drink or even bathe in. 
Um, communities like my own, communities like my own, like from Socket, should be considered a food desert. We should have a supermarket at every community. People should be having access to healthy and affordable fruits, vegetables in general, and like without worrying about the cost. Like we um, mentioned before, in low-income communities, there is 21.2 percent more to buy groceries at Stop and Shop compared to a higher income community, which I find crazy to me, but you know. <laughs> uh, another thing would also be, nobody would be speaking out in cold weather, but of course the dream is not reality. Instead of adding chairs in our parks that are anti-homeless, that have that little bar in the middle where homeless people cannot lay down on the bench, we should be having more policies that protect our homeless community. For example, creating a color policy where homeless people should not be outside past a certain temperature, um, I think people forget that homeless people are people too. So it's important for them to be in a warm, safe place during cold times and hot times as well to prevent death or their health crisis. This one that I'm going to talk about is kind of personal to me. Access to equal education work. So where our community's um, economic background should not really play a role in how much money is being put into schools and our children's education. I attended a school called Cumberland High School. At Cumberland, I literally received the best education I've ever received in my, like, what, what, 12 or 13 years of being in high school education now. So at Cumberland, they literally had all the resources and funding to make sure students were equipped with basic skills and um, needed to succeed. They had new books and material. They had updated and advanced curriculums. They had requirements such as financial literacy and art. While at Cumberland, I became financial financially literate, while my classmates at Wasakit still are financially illiterate. Um, I feel like Cumberland exposed all their students to um, different resources, and while at Cumberland, I was visibly able to see that my teachers enjoyed the job. While my whole time at Cumberland, I didn't have any other teacher. I had that one main teacher, and that was it. And to know in the 2021 um, year, 2021 year, it was reported that the median income of Cumberland was 104,613, and I attended Cumberland during the 2020-2021 school year. Returning back to Socket for the 2021 school year of August, my sophomore year, I noticed a difference in materials, education, environment. And since, since my sophomore year, I had multiple classes where I had repeated teachers, teachers leaving in and out, not enjoying their job, not enjoying where they're at. And students still to this day don't know about things such as financial literacy, which I feel like is insane. Like everyone should be financially literate coming out of high school. And, and it's important to note that in 2021, the reported median income for Osaka was 48,822. As you can tell, that's a big difference. And that was seen in the school system. And I definitely say, lastly, the reevaluation of our police and criminal justice reform. Um, my dream would be that we address the systematic racism here in Rhode Island. Systematic versus racism is everywhere, but it's so prominent in Rhode Island, but people ignore that. I feel like there's been so many cases where a lot of courts have been using excessive force against our community members instead of restorative practices. And when our community members speak out, they're ignored or they're even bigger targets thrown on their backs. I feel like we should reevaluate our police training and incorporate training such as non bias, making sure that we're having police, like police in our communities for the right reasons. We should have training that target what Michael talks about a lot mental health crisis and mental health resources. When you're um, approaching someone during a mental health crisis, you don't know how they're going to act, but I feel like our police should be aware of that without being so safe to pull out their gun or anything of that sort. Um, I would also definitely say we need off I would love to see officers who reflect the communities that they're put into. We have officers from suburbia put into a low-income community. They're like, what the heck is going on? And they don't know how to respond to that community. So having someone in that community who looks like some, like the people in the community kind of closes that gap between our community members and police. And my last hope would definitely be um, for the youth in Rhode Island training schools to have a mentorship program when they, they come out of that training school program, they're not committing the same crimes that put them into that school. Um, provide consistency and support their lives, something that they so lack, and a lot of those kids in those training schools are kids coming from the foster system, or kids who are in group homes, so how can we provide for them and how can we support them? Um, I would just like to first, that was amazing.
amazing, thank you. I would like to add on to that. So I think it's, we talked about progress over the years, and I think it's really interesting. I lived in Cumberland for six years. I actually went to Cumberland High School. It was a little different when I was there. A little different. The curriculum was great, but there really wasn't a lot of awareness around diversity. So, you know, Cumberland, I, I, certain parts are very diverse, but some areas are not, so when you have that all together, you get a little dicey, but to hear that there has been progress makes me really happy. Um, my hope for economic justice is also basically needs being met, but also awareness around resources. You know, there are resources out there, but a lot of these youth don't know about it. Like, a lot of my clients don't even know that there's a homeless bill of rights. I hand them out to them when they come in, and that's sad that they're experiencing homelessness and they don't even know their rights. So basic needs is also another thing. I really would like to see less youth coming into the drop-in center, not because I don't want them to come in, but because they shouldn't have to come in. They shouldn't have to come in asking for food, you know, what do I do? I, I, I have health insurance, but it doesn't cover this. Like, it's, it's sad, and I'm trying not to get emotional, but I really want to see these basic needs met for these youth because, you know, they've already been traumatized and most of them are young and instead of enjoying their years as a teenager and as a youth, they're worrying about where they're going to sleep at night, where, what they're going to eat, and they don't give their youth back, that that's not something they should be worrying about as 17, 18, 19. They should be enjoying themselves. Um, the people that aren't in the room right now, I want to assume that if you're here, it's because you're in a position where you're, you're stable enough, you know? You're able to come to these meetings and not have to worry about work, unless you're here for work, and that's the right. But then I also want to go back to the, the point you mentioned about criminal justice reform. Recently, this past year, um, I was trained in restorative justice. And while in these trainings, we were talking about the criminal justice system and how broken it is. When we think about it, our state is paying so much money to criminalize our youth, when in reality, we can spend that same amount of money, although it's significantly less, but we can spend that same amount of money and give restorative training, well, not trainings, but restorative practices and implement them to a point where our students, and I'm saying students because at the end of the day, they're still students. They're still learning how to be a human, how to be alive, um, as we all are. But these students, instead of being criminalized and having to live their life in a prison and then leave not knowing what world, like what is going on in the world, they can leave understanding, first off, I did something wrong. Second of all, I'm gonna talk to the person that I did harm to. And how can we bridge that gap so that both people feel satisfied. And then third off, that they get the resources that they need. Because oftentimes, and specifically with death, we're thinking about the person, and we're thinking about the victim in the situation, and we're really like compassionate to them, but we're not compassionate to the person that robbed something. We're not thinking, why did they feel the need to do this? Because, and I'm saying this like, specifically for the people I have in mind, which are low income people, we don't rob for fun. A lot of the times, low-income people rob because they need something. They need food. Um, they need like a, a nice, warm coat. They need clothing. They need all these things and just can't afford to buy it. Um, and then secondly, with that education piece, right now that I'm in a school that has enough funding, I'm seeing how many resources are out there and how much time I've spent not getting those resources. I went to a very underfunded school to a point where there was days where I wouldn't come in because I knew there was going to be a sub. And I don't need one sub, I need a sub for most of my classes. So there's this learning gap where I'm seeing students like behind me as I'm walking to class talk about their private school experiences, talking about how they were able to go on all these flights, on all these amazing trips through their schools, and my fun trip was in kindergarten in Roger Williams. And then after that, I'm Roger Williams Park Zoo. 
And then after that, it stopped because we couldn't afford it anymore. And then after that, we had broken Chromebooks for about, I think they were six years old by the time I graduated and we're still using them. And our textbooks were kind of like dying out. So we had to switch to online, which was another expense. And then the teachers did not get to have the trainings for those textbooks. So it's just a lot of issues uh, that we have to think about. Economics is a byproduct of our society. And so we have to look more deeply about the foundations of our society. For example, justice, education, and then health. I hope for Rhode Island to thrive economically in ways such as um, using our state budgets in ways that we need. And I'm saying that, like, emphasizing that as a student. Um, I really want to emphasize what Marco just said about the Chromebooks and te textbooks. Um, when our schools adequately equip us uh, with the right resources, um, they are preparing us to study to become successful. And with that, we have millions and millions of dollars of funding, which we do not know what goes like what our school uses it for. Um, we I was a part of a group, it was called like we worked on this thing called ESSER, where we <coughs> did a little thing where we went to our schools and asked them what we use our funding for and who's in charge of it. Um, and my school said it was confidential information when it is not. Um, instead of using our funds for things that we need, like uh, the right programs for our school, new textbooks, new Chromebooks, our schools are using them for security cameras. They are using them to fund other things instead of things like mental health, with, which students really need. So instead of like setting us up for failure, we need to, they need to set us up for success. So for me, economic justice is really just a means to the end. Um, and the end being that everyone feels loved and everyone feels like they're a part of a community um, I'm not someone who really cares about supply and demand or anything like that, but I think if the policies that you know we've all talked about here are enacted and implemented in a way that is equitable, we will have a Rhode Island where everyone is thriving and people can live their hopes and dreams. Y'all, I cannot even put into words just just how powerful all of that was. From your aspirations, to the work that y'all are doing on a day-to-day -day basis, I want you all to understand just what a difference you are making. Whether it is for one life at a time, or to create an entire system of systemic change. Y'all have done so much in the amount of time that you've been on this earth. And what excites me the most is that y'all are just getting started. So please give it up for the Dreamers panel. Maria, Marco, Kimia, Sylvia, Terry Ron. I'll keep it going. I don't want to.